Hey, y'all, just a quick heads up. This video you're about to watch on pen turning was actually originally part, much, part of a much bigger video. Uh, this turning basic series is me working through kind of a semester teaching this kind of stuff. And I knew from the get go that the section I was going to do on mandrel turning was going to be a monster. I just didn't know really how big it was. And when I filmed everything out the way I wanted it, covering not only the tools, the techniques, but also giving you some tips and tech, uh, tips and suggestions for how to make them very efficient so you could do a production run so that even as a brand new wood turner, you could begin making stuff that you can actually merchandise to offset the cost of investments or as family friend gifts and stuff like that, just batching those out. Well, whenever I covered all that subject, it was just way too long a video, so I broke it up. And the first video I, pr I uploaded a day or so ago was mainly the hardware aspect of it and giving you different ways to accomplish the same task. This video, if you didn't see it, will still make sense because we're mainly talking about the kinetic side of it. I'm going to be talking a lot about techniques, some ideas and theories on how to accomplish stuff, and I will give you my opinion on what makes a good quality pen design. And the last video in that I broke out of this larger one is all about that production works. Tips and techniques to be efficient on that kind of stuff. Hey, diving deep in the content is the worth the effort way. But if I didn't cover something or you have a question, please leave those comments in the thing. Because like all of my turning basic series, the following Tuesday to this upload, I will do a live Q&A and I will answer the questions from my Patreon members first, and then I'll dive in and uh, kind of organize the questions in the comments here to make sure I get all of those. And that's something I do for all my coursework kind of classes. Now, if you're not able to make that live Q&A, don't worry. I will archive it, and I will come back to this video, and in the description, I will put a link to that archive. So, I hope you enjoy this. Let's make a pen. So a good starting point for making a pen is picking out a pen kit. And there are a lot of options out there uh, from online stores. If you're lucky enough to have a woodworking store around you, uh, they probably have a whole section on a wide variety of pen kits. You can just go pick yourself out one. Uh, you can order catalogs from a whole bunch of different companies out there. But most commonly nowadays, you're probably going to do it online. I will tell you this, there are a lot of companies that are selling pen kits. It comes down more to the service side of the equation as to which one you will probably prefer. Because I have a feeling most of these are just import-export kind of companies. They're all selling the same kits, though some of them might call them different names. Probably the, one, the pen kit most of us will start out, especially if you are uh, going to like a school or you're going into somebody's shop and they're letting you turn a pen kit is one that's generally referred to as a slimline kit, a seven millimeter kit. Um, it's pretty much the least expensive of decent quality pen kits out there and they've just kind of dominated the entry level market because of the price point. This right here is what I would refer to as a slimline style kit. This is actually a pencil, not a pen, but it all works pretty much the same. The only difference is the hardware that you're putting into it. But, you know, normally they came with a uh, black band for the little clip and stuff like that. The center uh, decoration was straight, uh, generally chrome or gold, and a uh, very standard style front end of it. Uh, I made, this is pretty much the one I made for all my students just because of the price point. I will tell you, it is not my favorite to sell, not because of the quality or anything like that, because the ones that I do sell basically have the same internals as this pen. But it's because of this straight section right here and the straight back there. I've just always found that no matter how smooth a transition you get, you can always, it doesn't, it's not a comfortable fit for me to sell at a premium price point. I have a feeling that when people feel it, they will notice that, and it's just it's a, it's a transition point. Same with the situation right here. Most people that make this style of pen, they don't have this kind of organic curve. They will make something very, very straight because it aligns up with that center section right there. But to me, this feels very mechanically made. It's not handmade and that's not as comfortable for me. 
I prefer a model called, uh, commonly out there, the streamlined version. And basically, if you notice it, it's the same exact parts. The top is going to be the same. The base is going to be the same. The only real difference is this center section, which has some kind of ribs right there, rib for your pleasure, I guess. But because of that, the transition, when you're just playing around with it, just feels much, much better. And you will pay probably a 40% premium just for getting that little center section right there. And what I mean by premium is that I seem to remember when I was selling, uh, making these for my students, they were about a buck and a half each. Right before I went and filmed this video, I researched it and they were selling for between three and four dollars depending on which company you were going for. The streamlined versions I seem to re remember selling for about two and a half bucks each. Nowadays they're selling for a little over five dollars. So it's about a 40% premium just for that center section and I kind of believe that the mechanics which we will talk about in a second uh, might be a little bit better but I have no faith on that one. I do know some companies that advertise this kit say that the plating on the streamlines is a little bit better than the uh, slim lines. I, in, I can't tell the difference. And again, these are all beat up pins that have been knocking around my shop for five or six years. Now what you're going to get in a kit generally is generally the brass components. If you're buying the kits, make sure that you get them all from the same company. Uh, one of the difference between the streamlines and the slim lines, at least from my remembering, is the different parts from the bottom to the top are slightly different size, where on the less expensive versions they use the same exact pieces. Then you have a transmission. This is what allows the pin to uh, retract and come through. You'll have your little clip. You'll have a top piece. And then you'll have a center section and a tip, so to speak. I pretty much only order what they call a round top versus these uh, standard flat tops. And once again, you pay a slight premium, though I can't imagine the cost for them is uh, in, uh, to produce them is anymore. But once again, it comes down to the feel. That harsh edge on a very organic, muscular pen just doesn't quite feel right. And when you have these curves, if you are, you know, a quarter of a millimeter off right here, which is, well, that's the kind of precision we're talking right here, you won't really notice it. But if you're a little bit off here, you will notice it because it transitions into a flat. And that's another reason why I don't like those slim lines with the straight center uh, decoration piece. And the pins are basically, I believe they're cross refills. You can get them just about anywhere. Now, when you get your kit, you need to get the corresponding bushings that go along with it. And the bushings are basically specifically sized pieces of metal that, base, that will align up and tell you how the parts will match up together. So we put these on the mandrel and that goes through. I will tell you, the bushings won't last forever. If you can see on this one right here, it's kind of started to wall her out in the middle because of, as I sand it, you, you, you can sand away the metal after a while so they won't fit perfectly. So just plan, you know, every hundred or so pins, uh, if you turn that many, that you're going to need to replace the bushings and the bushings aren't that much money. But they are different per pin because the center decoration of this one uh, requires a little bit bigger uh, bushing than those slim lines, which the slim lines use the same bushings in all three sections because the corresponding parts are all the same exact diameter, just to make it simple. After that comes the fun part, picking out your material. Uh, you can do any kind you want. Generally, when you do the wood, you're going to want, oh, that one has a worm, so that one's trash, but you can, you generally want the grain to be pretty straight, though I'm going to use one that's kind of wild. If you know the grain is curving this way, it's curving that way and stuff like that, because as long as you're not completely quarter sawn all the way down, if you let the 
grain moves a little bit sideways or wanders, you can get some cool effects. And all of us have seen straight grain. So I'm just going to show you what a little wild piece of wood would do. And once again, I'm looking at where the pin will be in the blank to see what the colors are going to be. That one right there, you know, it's got a lot of plain stuff, but right down the center, it would have a stripe going down, which would be kind of cool. The final thing you're going to need is a drill bit. And these streamlined, slim lines, and a lot of the ones that use the A mandrel that we are using, the most common one, they're called seven millimeter pins because the hole you drill in the wood is seven millimeters. So just grab yourself a seven millimeter bit. So now that we got our kit, bushings, and piece of wood, and start making something. Now, uh, this is one of the things that in all of woodworking, I always go back to the saying that it always comes down to the grain. So if you have something a little bit wild, a little bit funky, uh, you really want to pay attention to how you use the grain. Because we want it to not only match up so it flows from the front to the back, because if you were to cut these and then reverse them, it wouldn't match up and it would look kind of uh, funny. You also want to make sure that you get the alignment of the whole set just perfectly uh, so that they won't match up. Because if you cut it in half and then the one hole is slightly offset to one side, the other one's over here, once again, the grain won't match up and it won't look as best it could. So here's some tricks I do. Some kits, the brass parts are different sizes. This one right here, one's a little bit shorter than the other one, as you can see. The shorter one is for the tail section. You can tell the lineup and the longer one up front. Makes sense, right? So when you lay them out, you want to examine the piece of wood as, as best you can to figure out where you want to place the stuff. I notice that the grain is a little bit wilder on the top side than it is this side. In the pin, a lot of it is covered up with a clip on the top side right here. So I would actually prefer to flip this piece of wood around so that the, the really the best part of the blank is going to be shown the most. Next, I'm going to take the corresponding piece of uh, brass. I will lay it on the end. I'll give myself, you know, a good quarter inch on this side and give myself a pencil line. Then line it up here and give myself a good quarter an inch on this side and give myself a pencil line. So I've obviously made these two blanks bigger than they need to be. I'm now going to come over here and using either a marker, I'm going to do a corner to indicate those corresponding pots. I know a lot of people We'll use like a sharpie or something like that and put a line down the middle. But if you have a very porous wood or a very dry wood, it can actually soak that ink into the wood a little bit. And after you turn the, the pen, this is closer to the center of where your wood pen's going to be than the corner. So if it soaks, it'd have to soak a lot farther coming from the edge than right here. And all that little line is there to do is to help you get it aligned back on the mandrel before you saw it. Now, if I remove a large section of this thing right here by splitting it on something like a table saw with a really wide curve, you can tell when I bring those back together, the grain is not going to align. Right now, this is the edge, and that is the edge. I bring those two pieces together. Well, this grain right here comes in that way. They aren't going to touch because I've removed so much material. So the idea is when you split it, you want to have as small a curve as possible and get that as perpendicular as you can. Now, I would commonly do this one uh, with a bandsaw because a bandsaw blade is generally a little bit thinner. But even if you don't have that, the, the best way and the way I did it for years was with a handsaw. Simply come over. Grab my cheap little miter box. You can buy them or make them. Go ahead and grab a cross-cut handsaw. Come over, and it takes this long to do it, even in a very hard piece of wood like this fog wood right here. Come down in, line it up. Don't be too proud that you're using a jig to hold the saw. Saw straight down. This saw plate makes the absolute thinnest curve there is. 
that takes you what? 15 seconds. You grab a hundred of these, you know, turn on the TV, you can batch out a whole bunch of them. You put little lines or stops right here. You don't even have to measure when you're doing a whole bunch. Just look at the blank and say, I want that to be the top, the bottom. Line it up with the line you want, make it cut. Don't worry about it. Now I'm also going to cut off the end of the top piece, same exact way. Line it up on the line. Make quick work of sawing through. So now notice when I bring the parts back together, I come back over, I make sure I get the corner line or the line in, uh, line in the center lined up and how the grain, because the kerf was so thin, matches up pretty much all the way around. Next we're want, going to want to drill the hole and if you're just doing one, the easiest way to do it is to find the center by just connecting the corners. And yes, this is not a perfect square, but because we cut it in half, and I'm actually doing this on the center kerf right here, even if it doesn't find the dead center, it will be the same spot on both sides because you know they were close to each other on the board, so their shapes are pretty much the same. Then I like to take an awl and just create a little divot right on that crosshair section. This makes it easier for the drill bit to get started. So from here it's just dropping in to whatever you're using to clamp it. Again I have this little device right here so that's what we're going to do. And because I'm just doing one I'm just going to freehand it using the bit to find the center and then having at it. Now the thing is, if this doesn't drill a hole directly aligned 90 degrees all the way through, it's not going to matter that much because we have a lot of meat, a lot more meat in the blank than we actually need. And the point where it touches the other side of the pin, well, they sh we shared the center point right there. So at least those two points will be in line so that the grain will all match up. <laughs> Next up, we're going to want to glue the brass pieces in the center. But an important, often forgotten step is you've got to rough up these little brass tubes. And you don't want to rough them up in line. You want to rough them up kind of sideways. That basically gives uh, the glue something to grab onto because these are just too slick as they are. Uh, so just kind of scuff them up, giving you nice scratches around the circumference so that it won't slide in and out. Now, I like to use a medium thick CA glue. You can use, I'm not sure brand matters with CA glue. Uh, I like the medium thick just because uh, it doesn't run as much. And I do not use a um, accelerator, something to make it dry even faster. Uh, though I will use a paper towel because strangely paper works a little bit like an accelerator with CA. So if you ever get a little bit on your finger or something like that, just kind of wipe it off with a CA, with a paper towel, and it'll pretty much be dry instantly. Now even though it's just glue, you're going to want to make sure you have your glasses on just in case anything splashes up. And there are some kind of fumes that go along with this. The second thing you want to do is, you know, make sure you get the right parts. I just so happen to cut these about the same size, but if, but if you'll remember, I wanted the longer piece, the, the tip to be on the water grain and that's that right there. So what I'm going to do is get the longer brass piece. It goes on front, it goes right there and notice that I have them in the orientation where they, are, uh, where they join. When you glue the brass in there, I suggest you glue it from the join, not from this side, okay? And I'll show you why in a second because remember, I'm trying to reduce the amount 
of material removed here so that we can get a tighter grain pattern. Now, a lot of people like using a tool like this where they can just put the, the brass on there so that they don't have to risk put, getting their fingers dirty with this. And also, whenever you slide it in, it'll actually push it past uh, the edge a little bit. I'll show you a trick that uh, I use to get that little bit past it without having to mess with my fingers. And when you do this, it has to be a pretty decisive move. You do not want to hesitate putting these in, otherwise uh, it'll, it'll dry before you get it all the way through. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run a, a bead of CA down here. Not too much, not too little. Right like that. Then as I put it in, I'm going to twist it so that CA coats the entire thing. Twisting it through as I go along. And it's going to start to re get resistance. From here, I will dab it on my paper towel and then I will tap it. And the gravity should let it push it down a little bit past the face. I waited a bit too long because I was talking to you, so I'll just use this right here to push it forward a little bit more. But it's already dried in there. That little touching to the paper really does speed it up. So here we go, once again, coming in from the center. A race with the clock to get it all the way seated before the CA dries. Notice my the portion where my fingers are does not have any CA on it, so I'm not risking gluing my finger to it. Twist my way down, get it fully seated, and then tap it a few times. Whoops, too far. There we go. Just a little bit below the top portion. That's perfect. Next up, we're going to have to face the wood to the brass, or even cut the brass back a little bit uh, if we need to do that one. So we're going to be using my most hated tool that I talked about earlier, the pen mill, which I'm going to give this one a quick sharpening before I use it. And I'm sorry I forgot to turn the record on before I sharpened it, but I've already sharpened it, but I'll quickly go over how I did it. I basically took the pen mill portion apart like that and then starting with my roughest grit you can buy these little diamond things just all over the place uh, I just took a few swipes on the back side generally you do not sharpen the back sides of things like your forcing or bits but all I wanted to do was clean up this little edge right there just to make sure there's no gunk on that one right there and if I put a slide as a back bevel I wasn't too concerned with it but it looks something like this I started out with my roughest one and literally one or two swipes with it was all I needed and I went through the different grits the same way, okay? Just like that. And then I came to the front and I would find the bevel by rocking this tool back and forth and then I would take a few swipes starting with the medium and going to the fine. I skipped the rough one. And it was literally one or two stripes. And my only objective was to put a little bit of a shine on the tip, just sharpening the edge. I wasn't really concerned with the middle bit or the back bit, just that one little bit. And I don't know if you can tell, but right now, each one of those blades just has a little bit of a shine on its cutting edge. And that was my goal. After that, just reassemble it. and put it in a, drill, uh, a hand drill. Now some people will mount these in, in their drill press uh, so that they could use that clamping mechanism to hold the work uh, when they're drilling it. I'm a big madly man. It's not that hard to do. I'm just going to hold it in my hand. So basically it's just a matter of dropping the pen mill in there, starting it at the tip so that that cutting edge can clear away the glue. And that glue's only going to be on this side. It's not gonna be on that side because the way we assembled it. 
And then once that's cleared and reamed out so that the other parts will fit, just give it a good straight hold and go at it until you've cleared off the wood and the, and the uh, brass is shiny. I, I was a tad bit high with the brass, so I haven't cleared away the wood yet, so I'm going to go a little bit deeper. And there we go. And if you watch my four cuts video, you'll understand that this is the harshest cut you can do with any kind of blade. It is a end grain scraping cut. So that edge I just created by sharpening it, that's only going to last for 10 to 15 seconds. So once again, start the beginning to clear out the glue, come down and go down until you see the shiny bit of the brass. There we go. It's now flush with that brass piece. But if you remember me saying one of the worst things about that bit was that the center dulls quicker. Well, I can feel right here, this brass, I don't know if you can see it, is slightly proud. I'm not going to worry about that one because whenever I assemble it, I will press it and that should kind of compress that a little bit so it will still fit, fit fine. But any more than that amount right there, you need to sand that back somehow. Now these two ends, they were the center section, so we, want, we didn't want to have to remove too much material, but on this side, I'm going to have to remove a good quarter inch. So, even though visually I'm looking at that right there, it looks like I've touched the brass. I haven't yet. There's a difference. That brass will really shine up when I cut into it just a tad bit. See the difference? I now know I've reached a bra brass and it's completely parallel. And if you're into a little bit of silence, what we've actually done is we've cut across a grain. So there's very little holding this, these shavings together. So if you want to just play around with it, you can actually pick it up in your hand. And with just a twist, I'm basically crushing all those calamari and it just turns to dust. Ooh, magic. Now to mount that pin blank, first taste in my example using the cheapest of mandrels, I'm going to take the brass knurl uh, nut off of off the end, plop it in, give it a good hard seat, and now we start assembling the bushings for the different parts. I've gotten in the habit that I will always put the uh, the the tip the the t the bottom of the pin towards the head stock, and then the clip side will always be for the tail stocks, so that I know I just it helps me with the shaping. They're all, I'm consistent that way. So just pick away. Whether you like to do it this way or this way, just pick it and stick with it. These bushings are sized for the individual parts. This is the tip right here, and if you want to check it, you can actually slide it on that part right there, and it should fit very flush. So this one is for the front section. I'm then now going to put the longer point on there. So I just look at it. I line this two ends and I can see that this one recesses farther. So that's going to be the back end side. But I want to make sure that I check for my pencil line on the edge or this one I have one in the face. And that is going to be towards the center. Then I have a bushing for the middle part which is a little bit bigger than the first one. And you can always check it just by feeling it. I've actually worn this one down a bit, so it's a little bit smaller than this right here. But I'm okay with that because this has those rounded points. So it still feels okay to me to have it like that. So that one goes in there. And then the next one goes in. Remember, making sure our line is lined up with this piece right here. Now, it's going to spin in use and cutting. So they're not going to stay lined up perfectly like this. They'll do this action, but when we reassemble it, it'll all work out. And then we need to put the final bushing on the end, and that's for that cap piece. 
But notice right now that does not extend back into the threads. So I cannot use that brass knurled piece to squeeze it. Simple solution right there is just to grab another bushing of whatever size and now I'm into the meat of the knurling so that I can now squeeze it together. Tighten up the tailstock and then just advance it until it holds. No more pressure than that and then really tighten up the quill so that it doesn't back off any. So now we have a very stable block that just isn't going anywhere until we start turning. I will say this, I like having a long tool rest. Uh, this is a robust one. It's one of the best investments you can do for improving it. And I talked about this kind of stuff in that second video on, our, on the tools where I talked about the accessories to the lathe. Now it's important to get your tool rest parallel with your lathe. The easiest way I know to do it is to stand behind it like we are right now and look down and line it up with the bed rails. Make sure your gap is equal on both ends and you should be parallel with the lathe that way. So real quickly, I've gone to get my spindle roughing gouge and that's the only gouge I'm going to need for this project. It's the only one I really use on pens uh, when I'm just making one off. So we come over here. A lot of people ask, how fast should you turn it? Well, I'm going to tell you right here now, turn as fast as you want. You could probably max out your lathe's speed and it'll be perfectly fine. The reason is it's such a small di diameter piece that the actual speed of the wood coming over the blade isn't going to be that high even though it's spinning really fast. But if I had a really big bowl, I was spinning at that same speed where the speed of the wood going over the blade is extreme. That's why you don't turn really big stuff fast it's all the speed of the wood going over the blade. So real quickly, I'm just going to round it smooth all the way across. How you do that is you touch it to the tool rest, touch it to the tool rest, touch the bevel to the wood, even though it's spinning, lift it up until you see shavings coming off. Shavings. Then put, lock it into your hip and move your body. You see that happening right there? You can come over and you can tighten up the neural, neural, walk, neural thing. It just means it's not spinning, uh, it's not gripping as much. Now, that's about the speed most beginners will start turning these things. Touch it to the tool rest. My hand is touching on the tool rest itself also. That's my depth gauge. Bevel, edge, lock it to your body, move your body. Notice it's my entire body moving, not just my hands. You're shifting from one foot to the other to move it across. Now I want to talk a little bit about shape. As I said earlier, I am not a fan of straight lines in my pens. That's why I chose the pen kit I have because it allows me to add curves. I'm also not a fan of having things proportional. A lot of people would think that you want to put, if you're going to add a curve, that you would put the middle of the curve right in the middle of the piece. I'm telling you from experience that doesn't feel very good and it looks kind of funny. Uh, it's kind of one of those things you want to mimic the muscles on your body. You know, your muscles are not in the center of your joint. Generally, they're up or down a little bit. I mean, just look at your legs or your calves. That's how they kind of work. They squeeze up like that, okay? So if this is a leg, 
having the the high point of the curve maybe two thirds of the way up and two thirds over here it kind of creates a little bit more of an organic shape to it so at this point in time i would lay i would kind of eyeball i don't use a pencil all the time where i want the high point to be and then i will start working it over towards the edges not quite getting to that depth the last little bit of distance i will cut away with sandpaper so here we go finger on the tool rest Place it down, touch a tool to the tool rest, bevel down, I find my high point, and I just begin working it down. I like about that curve right there on this side, and I'm looking for the shape I like. Not necessarily the thickness I like now, just the shape, okay? Do the same thing on this side. Maybe a little bit here. This finger on the lathe is really giving me this depth control. A lot of people don't recognize that. They'll have their hand back here and they're just assuming their arms can control that depth. No, no, no. You have to have a finger here to give you that sensation, that feel. Coming over, bringing it down. Just working on the overall shape right now. And obviously I do this a lot faster than the production runs and I'll show you those tricks later in the video, but this will give you an idea. So I kind of like that shape a little bit. So from here on out, all I'm doing is lowering it evenly from both directions until I make it close to flush. Always starting at the high point and going down. High point, going down. Never coming up, because here, while this is a roughing tool, look at the finish so far. Notice you don't see any tear out at all or anything like that. I'm now gonna come up the grain, and it might not show because this grain is so wild, but let's just see. If I, if I come uphill, I imagine we're going to get some tear out. It's not going to look as, I can even feel it happening. So just like that, can you see it's just duller than it is over here. That's because there's microscopic tear outs all through there. So I'm just going to keep working it, keeping the shape I like until I get to the thickness we need. This side's getting closer than this side, so I'll just work on this side a little bit more. I'm going a little slower than normal because I know this grain is wild. Not quite feeling as it normally does in my hand. Okay, now looking at this, it looks about the same height on both sides. You can, in the camera, you can see the reflection in the uh, tool rest. They're about the same height. Me, I'm looking down at the bed rails to judge the height right here. But this curve kind of, I like it to be a little bit more this way. So the last little bit I, of shaping I do with sandpaper. Now, uh, this is the finest dust there is, and you're going to do a lot of sanding, especially if you're doing production work with this kind of stuff. Whenever my normal setup, before I had a big dust collecting system, is I would make sure I have a fan in the background, which I do right now. I just can't turn it on because of the camera and the microphones. And I would set up just a normal shop vac in the old days, and I would actually Velcro it down on the tool rest with a nozzle that is sitting right here. And I mainly turn this way until the very end so all the sawdust is going over the top straight into that dust collecting system it works wonderfully if you do it that way uh, just understand you're not going to hear that right now because of the mic system going on and i'm actually not going to need to do that much sanding on this particular piece but before we start standing this particular example i want you to notice 
how not close I am to my bushings right here. These are pretty good, but right there, I'm, I can feel it. So you can use sandpaper to get it. I'm actually going to start at 180, just because i that's what I want to start at on this particular one. And if you have the ability, reverse your lathe so it's not coming towards you, it's going away from you. If you don't have that ability, then what I would suggest you do is turn from underneath. That way the sawdust is, is going to be going that way as it comes off the bottom of the lathe. Also, you want to turn the lathe speed down quite a bit because you'll just burn up your sandpaper if you get too high. And I just sand until my shape is the way I want it. Notice I'm constantly moving. I'm never just, I'm never doing this right here because that'll give you deep grooves. Constantly move with your sanding. And I'm also not sanding off, not sanding from the steel onto the metal, the wood. Because that'll actually bring steel dust in here. And some woods that have tannins in it, it will actually blacken the edges. I'm always trying to sand off the edge. Okay, so I can see a little thing. I'm going to stop to see if that's a great. Nope, that's difference in 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 uh, the wood. So I'm going to sand that away. And then feel everything to make sure I'm level. Okay, that was 180 grit. Okay. I'm now going to go to 240, and I should have a 320. I just ran out of that sandpaper. But on the higher grits, you shouldn't have to do too much shaping work. We're just refining that surface. So once again, try not to come from the metal onto the wood. Always go off. Now, in between them, I'm going to take that same 220 grit and I'm going to go straight with the grain. And if you have some woods that where the grain really pops, this might be a good time to maybe squirt it with a little alcohol or alcohol and water mixture. That'll actually raise those grain fibers. It's kind of, what we've done is we've abraded the wood. We haven't actually cut it. And so we've kind of, it's kind of like carpet. We've just kind of smooshed it down and the, the liquid will actually make those fibers swell back up. So now it can come back on, over here and go with the grain and cut off all those fibers that have swollen a tad bit. Just gets you a little bit better finish that way. And now I'm going to go straight to the 400. And for most woods, that's pretty good. If you're working with acrylics or something like that, you're probably going to go up to like 6,000. We'll get to that later on. Stop it and then go with the grain for the last step. Now one last thing you can do is if you have something like a brown paper towel, you can actually burnish it. So right now we have a pretty cool finish right there. I had a little bit of tear out, but no big deal. So I'm going to actually turn it on. I've got the lathe spinning forward. So I'm actually going to take a something like a paper uh, bag or I'm going to use this towel. I'm actually going to put it underneath it. But the danger of this is if I wrap it around, it could actually grab onto itself and bring my fingers into it. So you can get hurt that way. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take an edge. I'm going to press straight up, 
but I'm not going to squeeze very hard. So if it does catch, the paper is going to either rip or if it catches, it's just going to come out of my finger. So no big deal. So now I'm going to turn the speed up. I'm just going to add some heat. Can you see how the shine came on that a little bit? You're actually burnishing the wood a tad bit. So with no finish whatsoever, we have a bit of a shine. Isn't that kind of cool? For a finish, I generally take a little bit of oil. I kind of like Mahoney's oil, which is a walnut oil. And I'm not going to coat it. I'm not even going to let it soak in very much. I'll just put it a little dropper on, the, on a rag or something like that. And then turning it by hand, I'll just lightly put it on. And I do this just mainly for the color. I like the oil finished color that comes out. This isn't adding much protection at all. Then when I'm doing it live, I will use some kind of friction polish. This is a combination of shellac and wax and some other stuff. You need a warning, this stuff goes bad over time and I'm actually not sure how old this end is, so we'll see. Shake it up really good. Squirt a little bit on that rag. And then by hand, spread it on. Let it sit for a bit. Do it a little bit more. This stuff is actually soaking in a tad bit. And then we're going to be a Boy Scout and add some heat to it. How does a Scout or Girl Scout make fire, create heat? They rub two sticks together. I have a stick there and I have a process stick here. So I'm just going to turn it on and press up and add heat. And that's going to dry the shellac, somewhat cure the oil, at least so it will be dry to the touch. And it will give it a nice sheen. It's not a gloss, it's a sheen. And it feels like wood. There are other finishes that you can do, like the CA finish that takes forever. But when I'm in a roll, this setup right here takes me about 30 seconds to go from start to finish when I'm working fast and what you end up with is a very nice looking finish. Let it cool down and then we'll assemble our pen. If you did more than one obviously you're going to leave the mandrel on there and you're going to basically just swap out the, 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 the wood and leave the bushings in the right order but if you're just doing one it's time to disassemble everything and the most important thing is place put the bushings back where they belong in a tool in a little fishing tackle box dedicated to that specific pen kit or just some way to organize it because otherwise you will lose them or they will get mixed up with other kits and it just becomes a nightmare I also because I always put the the nose or the tip on this way, I always keep them in the right orientation when I'm doing them. So here are our pen parts. We have our transmission, our tip, our round cap, our optional clip, and the center decoration. I don't know why, but I always tend to start with the front. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and these have a little bit of a lip right there so that you can actually get them started, but they're actually too big to fit inside there. So you want to get it started even, and then come over to your pen press, your, your clamp, clamp or whatever you got, make it level. And the key thing is you want to hold it so it stays perfectly parallel because more when these things go bad they kind of kink right there so i'm trying to figure out how to hold it while the camera can see it so it's just a gentle press forward if you see anything going wrong just trying to correct it as you go along and then give a good press there and there we go 
That's ready to rock and roll, and voila, we have a nice, smooth transition. Matched up with that bushing perfectly. Next up, we're going to install the transmission. Now, the transmission works in that the pin has some threads back here, these little replacements. So it slides in, and you screw it down. So the protrusion for the tip is a certain amount. What you have to do is figure out how far in to push that transmission. Now, on the first few ones, you know, I would say take it slow, maybe go up to the very last line, and then test it. So that's what I'm going to do right now. So we're going to drop the tip in there, put our transmission right on that center section. Make sure it is lined up with the center over here or the center on your, your clamp. It's kind of nice having those right there. Then just kind of hold it because it's going to be stabilized and you're going to slow. Let's see how I can do this so you can see it with the camera. It just slowly presses in and you go a little ways. Now if you're doing a batch production, after a while you kind of figure out how far you want to go. But I'm going to go a little bit short right this time. You place the pin in, screw it down, and then twist it so that you're engaging it just like you would uh, the transmission. See, obviously we aren't even extending out so far. so. Push it back through. I'm going to take it to that line this time. There we go. Right now it extends maybe an eighth of an inch, but when I close it back up, it's fully recessed. If you want it to go a little bit more, you can just push the transmission in a little bit more. Warning. You can't pull the transmission back out. So if you push it in too far, that's what that pin's gonna be like. So from here, this goes right there. It'll be a tight fit. And now we wanna assemble the tailpiece, which is just by dropping that. Oh, forget. This one, you screwed off. There's a little tiny thread you put through that little clip right there and that's probably why this one cost about 50 cents more than the flat top one is because it has two parts so we are going to tighten that up i seem to remember putting a little bit of loctite on uh, a little bit of thin ca on that thread back in the day but the other thing is you want to make sure that that one that little shoulder right there is on this side not that side so that when you press it, you can line it up. And this one, you kind of have to hold because the spring clip, if you've got this thicker, will want to kind of cant it a little bit like that, as you see. So I'm just going to kind of hold it and watch it to make sure it goes in straight. And if you can, so I got started with my hand. And then we begin to press, slow and steady. We've got a nice transition right there. So now all we got to do is figure out how the pin lines up. Dark, dark, boom. Check that out. Pretty cool. Now when you're done, save the bag the parts came in. These little baggies are great as little gloves. You put your fingers in there for when you're doing CA finishes on stuff like that. Uh, you can just kind of put the CA on a pen or whatever like that and use this to spread it out, smooth it out, all that kind of stuff. But then just throw it away when you're done. So I always save the bags because they, they become useful even in the future. Now I'm going to quickly turn a bunch of variety of different items for you to see the possibilities that are here. And after we go through that one and along each way, if there's anything different, I'll show you those techniques. But it's going to go pretty fast. And then I'm going to do a production run, making about a hundred of these. And I'm going to be using a lot of different techniques. And for example, I'm probably not going to be using a rough and gouge, but I'll be sticking with a skew just to speed things up. 
plus we'll use those other cool tools. So let's make a bunch of stuff. And you're going to have to come back to see that kind of stuff. That's the topic of the last section, of last video of this particular section. I told you we dove deep, but I hope you can see that there is a lot of information there that just isn't covered elsewhere. And if you gained a little bit from this, please do me a favor and like, favor, subscribe, do all those social medias. If you'd like to help subsidize us a little bit more than that, I have a lot of information down below. Because as we all understand, the analytics don't really, doesn't really like long-form educational content on YouTube. So your subsidization really does help out. And I always want you to remember that it's always worth the effort to learn, create stuff, and share it with others. Y'all be safe, have fun, and I'll see you in a few days for the next section.